Video games have influenced our culture for decades. The industry was built not only by video game creators, but also by standout players. In this series, we'll introduce you to some of the early pioneers that brought gaming to life. This is 8-Bit Legacy, a curious history of video games. Being a kid in the 90s meant spending most of your quarters trying to beat your friends in Street Fighter. The gaming community was filled with memorable players, but one kid seemed to eclipse them all. The legendary Tomo Ohira. One of the greatest video game players who ever lived. Tomo Ohira was this towering figure in Street Fighter 2. The guy that's legendary, that's the kind of guy you want to aspire to be. So why did the champion disappear? In 1991, arcades went through a renaissance with the release of Street Fighter II. The game re-energized the coin-op business, drawing people away from their home consoles and back to the arcades. Up until then, arcade winners were determined by the highest score. But with Street Fighter II, players dueled each other in one-on-one -on -one competitions. The fierce matches and cutthroat rivalries made the game into a bona fide sporting event, turning champions into legends. And a group of all-stars was forming in sun-baked Southern California. To get this story started, we first need to understand that Street Fighter is a lot more than a bunch of button mashing. And who better to explain the complexities of the game than legendary players Jeff Schaefer and Mike Watson? What Street Fighter is really is a chess game. They have six different buttons that you can push, and whether you're standing or crouching, the buttons are different. And so you have so much diversity of different punches and kicks in a fighting game. Each character has their own specific moves. Those specific moves can be used in combinations so there's so many different variations available in the game. Based on whatever character I'm playing, I know what distance that character's weak at. So it's all about forming your game plan around staying at that distance to win the game. You win. This is the bread and butter of becoming exceptional at any game. That's Street Fighter. And if you haven't guessed it yet, Mike and Jeff are really good at Street Fighter 2. I became the best player in Orange County, and then eventually I got banned from playing because it was a foregone conclusion that I was going to win. I would beat everybody. There was no one I ran into that I didn't beat. You know, I was a little kid just shooting my mouth off all the time, but that, that was part of my strategy, actually. We always played to win. The whole crowd was thinking like, wow, Jeff's on his own level. You know, no one can touch me. I was eating everybody for lunch. And that's when I met Tomo Ohira. He was about 13 years old, probably weighed about 90 pounds and was five feet tall. I mean, he was just like a kid. He's a smaller guy, so it wasn't intimidating or anything, but man, he played lights out, no mistakes. It's just, his play is just amazing. He's a gaming savant. You know, I must have spent over $20 in quarters to beat him one game, and I never beat him one game. I can't win one game off the guy. He's very much like Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods. They don't need to talk crap. They already know they're the best. He was hands down the number one player at the time. I, I was kind of dumbfounded by it. It was like Tomo, me, Jeff, and then fourth place is way down here. And in 1994, the three participated in a super tournament to find out who was the best player of all time. There was a big super tournament in NorCal that all of us went to. It was like the biggest battle royale ever in the history of Street Fighter at that time. We're finally going to find out, right? Is Southern California better than this group here? It was literally shoulder to shoulder, people packed in like sardines. And you can probably guess what happened. Tomo won it all. But then something unexpected happened. The world's best Street Fighter II player completely disappeared. He just quit. That was it. He never played Street Fighter again after that. 
I felt a little empty, I guess. He was my competition. He was always the one that would beat me. He just finally walked off into the sunset. Questions haunted the gaming community. Where is Tomo? Where is the champion? Everybody asked about him for years. His name rung out through the arcades in Southern California. Everyone wanted to find Tomo and play against him. But they never got that opportunity. The original gaming savant was gone. So at this point, you're probably asking yourself, what became of the legendary Tomo Ohira? This is my life now, getting balls out of the tree for the neighbor's kids. My name is Tomo Ohira. I used to play Street Fighter a long, long time ago. I was known as the first champion of Street Fighter, and the feeling was just incredible. I think people were a little bit surprised by me leaving kind of suddenly because I had such a passion for it. But eventually it went from, yes, I won, oh my god, I can't believe it, to, oh, okay, good, I didn't, I didn't lose today, so now I don't have to be upset tonight. And that's when I fell out of it. When we became adults, right, you don't have the eight hours a day to put into becoming like he was when he was a kid. He accomplished what he wanted. He left on top and we played one final tournament and he won, so he kind of walked out on a, on a high note. When something is done, I think you should realize it, face it, and let it go. So now, my passion is family. I have twin kids that are two years old, and as soon as they're old enough, I will hand them a gaming pad and see what they can do. You say, I win. I win. Yeah, say it louder. I win. I win. I win. Yeah, yeah. That's my life now. And if I had to turn the clock back and do it all over again, I would not change a thing. Finding the Master Sword in Zelda. Bouncing on a Goomba in Mario. Honing your skills in a duck hunt. All things you probably did as a kid with your first Nintendo system. For most of us, playing games was a pastime. But for one lucky man, this wasn't some hobby. It was his job. Nineteen eighty-one was a year of new frontiers. In the U.S., a new decade of technology and pop culture was approaching, making it a promising land for booming Japanese companies. America had said hello to a kitty a few years earlier, but it was a gorilla that stole the attention of the new generation. Donkey Kong was Nintendo's first big breakthrough in the Western arcade scene. The game helped the Japanese company climb its way up to America, eventually establishing a new headquarter in Seattle, Washington, to bolster their hit. And this is the story of one of their first employees, who was soon to become a gaming legend. No! This is Howard Phillips. This is Howard Phillips' gaming jacket. This is Howard Phillips' original 1989 Game Boy. And this is how Howard started working at Nintendo. Kind of embarrassing. I started at Nintendo in 1981. It was really just the five or six of us. I was the shipping warehouse manager. My role was to bring in all of the arcade games and unload them and record all the serial numbers and then pack them up for shipment. It doesn't sound like the greatest gig in the world, but working in the warehouse came with one pretty big perk. I could play all the games. Whenever a new game came in, I could open it up and plug it in and play it. But playing games could never be a full-time career. Or could it? Nintendo of America was run by this man, Mr. Minoru Arakawa. The company was looking to break into the U.S. market, but needed a little advice. Being Japanese, they were very, very attentive to the customer. And the customer was king. I was their kind of gateway into the U.S. zeitgeist and all of what players really wanted to play. Why you, Howard? Who knows why out of the few people who were working with the company at the time that I got kind of selected as being one of the more true voices. I think it was just my enthusiasm for play. You know, I'm a player's player. I love to play games. I love to play at everything. 
In 1985, Nintendo was ready to move out from the arcade and into the living room. Mr. Arakawa said to me, what do you think are the best games? And I played them all and I said, Mr. Arakawa, these are the best 15 games. Everybody will love these games. And so, the Game Master was born. Howard Phillips, also known as Mr. Nintendo. It's his job to test every Nintendo game that comes out. What is a Game Master? It was really just a focus on what it means when a player meets a game. It's that connection. We were really looking for someone to represent the gamer and to speak directly to the gamer. And Howard really fit the bill. He was like a grown-up, but he was still like a kid. He gave you the impression more of a character than a business person. I think the connection that I had with players was that shared love of just gaming. And then their mom or dad would show up and they would say, but you know, they're not educational or whatever the, the negative association was that they wanted to put with video games in their child. It may be the most addictive toy in history. Nintendo video games. Is it turning their brains to mush? Shame on people that produce that trash. It's child abuse in my judgment. It was saddening to me that that's how parents perceived their kids' joy as something that was maybe a negative. Video games had a bad rep, but Howard could see the positive effects the games had on kids. It was a shared love of the experience of discovering something new or being really, really frustrated at something, but just trying and being patient and persistent, which is learning. And the players wanted to learn more, more information, more tricks, more tips. And the Game Master was there to deliver. Nintendo Power, your direct connection to the pros for better play. The official magazine of video mastery for ordering information. My role was to make sure that every single bit of information in that 132 pages each month was accurate and spoke in a way that the players wanted to understand and know about. But that wasn't the only role Howard played. When we were setting up all the columns in Nintendo Power, we thought it would be great to include a comic strip. Howard Nestor is just a cartoon that describes a child player who's always trying to get past the next level in a game. And Howard is the game master who knows everything about the games, who can provide some tips. And Howard is you? That's me. Dear Howard Phillips, I am 12 years old and your biggest fan. My friends and I read Nintendo Power, who are the best in your business. Your biggest fan with a capital B, bye. The notoriety of being Game Master really was crazy. I would be pumping gas at the gas station. I would be buying potato chips at the supermarket. Or I'd be at a movie and kids would come up to me and their parents would come up to me and, you know, and say, oh, you're the guy? The guy who was able to turn his passion for video games into a once in a lifetime opportunity. So Howard, what was the best part about being Game Master? It was really fun to fulfill people's dreams, you know, and to shake the hand of some little kid and ask them about their favorite game and make them feel validated and like they're smart and cool. So it was really fun. Over. like your typical Western background, but it's actually an abandoned set of a video game. The Western was easy to accomplish here in New Mexico. We had the sets, we had the cowboys, we had the horses, we had everything we needed. Including a great villain, Mad Dog McCree. <laughs> There had never been a live-action, interactive video arcade game until Mad Dog came along. The year was 1990. The dawn of a new age of video games was about to begin. Arcades had small but powerful rivals in the living room. The smallest, the Game Boy, born in 1989. The scariest, the home console, Sega's 16-bit Genesis and Nintendo's Super NES. Now anyone could play high-end video games, anywhere they wanted. Arcade makers had to step up and utilize their main advantage, more storage space that could hold hours of video footage. Instead of computer-generated graphics, they used live action, live dialogue, and live actors. 
the type of production values that console games couldn't touch. Which brings us back to where we started, New Mexico. A place where a one-of-a-kind experiment changed the video game industry forever. The props from that first live action game still remain in a dusty warehouse outside Albuquerque. I'm Dave Roberts, and I was director on Mad Dog McCree. Hands up. It was our first entry into video games. <laughs> These are the fake dynamite sticks. The makers of Mad Dog weren't always in the business of making video games. They actually got their start making police training simulators. We shot things that police would encounter during their day. They put it up on a big screen and a police officer would walk into the room. He would have a pistol that had had a laser put into it and he would respond to whatever was happening on the screen. Once we knew how to do that, it made it a little easier to do Mad Dog McCree. My name is Robert Greeby and I was the CEO of American Laser Games. This is the aha moment, actually. Looking at this picture, I realized that there was a potential to turn this simulator into a video game. So that became Mad Dog, Mad Dog McCree. The team now had the technology to make a video game, but what they needed was a story. Being located in New Mexico, the Wild West was an obvious choice, and they didn't have to go too far to find their stars. My name is Russ Dillon, and I played Mad Dog McCree. I've lived in New Mexico all my life. I was born and raised here on this ranch. I've uh, been out here 60 years. We started shooting Mad Dog, nobody knew who Mad Dog was or who it was gonna be. Bob Greeby decided I would make a good Mad Dog, obviously not for my looks. Probably was because I could quick draw. That's well, pretty quick in those days. Finding a Mad Dog who could quick draw was easy. But transforming a blonde-haired, blue-eyed rancher into a rough-and-tumble outlaw from the Wild West? That's a different story. I guess the most time-consuming part was the makeup and the hair stuff. And that hair dye's a mess. If I'd sweat, you know, and we're doing this, it'd be black stuff rolling down, my, rolling down my forehead. When I saw him at first dressed as Mad Dog, I had no clue it was my husband. It was kind of like looking at somebody else. I feel like it's sticking around out there. I was dressed in the other thing black, and that horrid orange scarf <laughs> Looks almost like a carnival thing. But uh, I guess that became the trademark of Mad Dog was that orange scarf. The plot of Mad Dog McCree goes something like this. A gang of outlaws has laid claim to a small town, kidnapping the mayor and his daughter. The player's job is to kill the members of the gang and eventually Mad Dog himself, freeing the town from terror. Because players competed against live actors in the game, the biggest challenge was accounting for unpredictability. The crew had to shoot each scene in a way that allowed for multiple outcomes of the same situation. We've got four people in the shot. Who does the player shoot first? Oh my, he shoots number one first. Well, what if he shot number four first? Well, we've got to film that too. One scene alone, I'm probably four different people. I'm one of the guys who jumps out in the street and tries to shoot too. And then as you're walking up the street to the saloon, me and Al come out fighting. It was pretty corny, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's always a you know special place for Mad Dog because of what it was and what it became. We didn't know if the game would be a success. We didn't know if the product would work or not. I mean, it was on the job training for all of us. It's hard to see the light shining so bright. It's it really exploded instantly in popularity worldwide because nobody had ever seen anything like it. You better run, run, run. You couldn't hardly get near a game because it was just so popular. I 
I really appreciate just how much that we accomplished back 20 years ago. I never really thought that Mad Dog would have a legacy, but it's iconic in that it really sort of represented this moment of time when video gaming went from Pong and Pac-Man to Grand Theft Auto, you know. I think it was a wonderful stepping stone for the industry.